Welcome back. So, we will continue our discussion on the hopper feeders that we started in the last class. So, we started discussing the external gate hopper feeder and I said that here the design is quite simple like we have a uh, stationary plate. On the stationary plate we have a stationary outer sleeve and within that sleeve there is a rotating inner sleeve. This rotates and in the inner sleeve, rotating inner sleeve we have the slots in this section you can see this and uh, the mass of the parts is at the bottom of the uh, rotary inner sleeve and while rotating the mass of the part from the mass of the part the parts will be nested in the grooves and when the grooves will be aligned with the external gate, external gate is in on the stationary outer sleeve. So, the parts will be coming one by one through the external gate. This is the simple design of this. Okay. Now, the maximum feed rate that you are getting from this uh, hopper feeder that will be decided by the velocity and the uh, distance between the adjacent slots. Okay. So, let us see how it can be determined. Now, these are the three positions of the part which is shown in the figure here. Here, this is the rotary outer sleeve, sorry, uh, rotary inner sleeve which is rotating and this is the fixed sleeve which is stationary. Now, at a limiting velocity v, if the velocity is a certain uh, value, then the part will neither fall to the through the gate nor it will go through, but it will jam between the slot between the edges b here and the c. All right. Now, at any velocity below the critical velocity v, the part will drop through the gate because if the velocity is very high, in that case by inertia it will pass through the gate and it will not fall. At a lower velocity, it may actually clog between the b and c. At a particular velocity, which is an optimum velocity, the part will actually drop through the gate. Keeping that in mind, let us say in this figure, uh, let us say first uh, figure A, in this figure the part is just started falling, it is at the edge of the uh, gate. Now, in this figure, okay, the part has moved certain distance horizontally and certain distance vertically. All right. So, from the with respect to figure A, in the figure B, the part has moved horizontally. How we can find out that this is uh, one half root over d square minus uh, hg square. So, we can find out from here. All right. So, this is the d by 2. So, actually the part has moved up to d by 2, okay, diameter of the uh, gate or diameter of the part. So, this can be given by this, this square is equal to this square plus this square. All right. And from here we can find out that this horizontal distance that is d by 2, this will be equal to d minus this is d by 2, half of the root over d square minus h g square. Okay. This is d by 2. So, d minus d by 2 will be d by 2. So, this actually is moved by the horizontally moved uh, by the part. Now, at the same time, when it is it has moved horizontally from this position to this position, it has also moved vertically and that vertical distance will be d by 2 minus h g by 2. All right. Now, the horizontal movement has been done because of the v. So, that interval that is time taken to move the part horizontally from this position to this position will be distance divided by velocity. Uh, the velocity at which the part is falling uh, down the gate that we are taking and vertical distance that is the part is falling that is because of the gravity. So, that is why we can say that this time we can find out from the uh, normal equation that is L is equal to half a t square where the t is equal to root t 2 L by a, a is the gravity, L is the distance. So, this distance L here is this. So, this is the distance 2 into L, 2 into this distance divided by the acceleration. Now, in our case it is the acceleration due to gravity. So, the time that is uh, taken for the part to fall uh, vertically, okay, this can be given by this equation and this time is the time at which 
the part has moved horizontally from this position to this position. Okay. Now, since the time is the same meaning that at the same time the part is moving horizontally as well as vertically. So, therefore, this one we can equalize with this all right, and we can find out that from this we are finding out that this velocity at which the part will fall through the gate will be equal to 0.802. If you solve this equation, you will find out that this is 0.802 d into g to the power half. d by the way, this is the once again gate diameter or the part diameter, g is the gravity and this is root over. So, this can be easily found out. To give the largest value of the velocity, the gap h g which you have here this between the cylinder and the sleeve should be as large as possible. So, when the gap between the sleeve and the outer disc will be as large as possible, then the velocity will be maximum. Okay. For values h g greater than d by 2, however, there is a danger that the parts may become jammed between the corner b in the slot and the inner surface of the sleeve. What we mean to say is that if this distance h g, this is more in that case, this part will be jammed between b and the c or somewhere inside this within that sleeve. Taking h g is equal to d by 2, because as we said that if it is greater than d by 2, it will be jamming, if it is less than d by 2, it may not go through. So, let us take h g is equal to d by 2, h g we are saying is the gap between the inner sleeve and the outer sleeve, okay, this gap and if this is equal to d by 2, put the h g is equal to d by 2 here, then the f maximum can be found out from the velocity divided by the a s which is the distance between the adjacent slots and this will be equal to 0 0.802 d g to the power half is the velocity divided by the distance between the gap between the slots will be a s. So, divided by the a s. In general, not all the slots will contain parts and if E is taken to be the efficiency of the feeder, the actual feed rate is given by this into the uh, E. That means, this will be the efficiency. If you remember, we said last time while considering while uh, discussing the uh, reciprocating tube hopper feeder and the center board hopper feeder, we said that not all the time the feeder can actually provide the uh, desired number of parts. So, therefore, there is a concept of efficiency and the actual feed rate should be the maximum feed rate into the efficiency. So, here it. I hope this is understood. Here only uh, please put this efficiency because 0 0.802 dg to the power half by a s, this is the f maximum and actual feed rate f, this is actually f max into the efficiency. And the efficiency as it was discussed earlier can be found out experimentally that is you are running the uh, feeder sometimes and find out that what is the average number of parts coming out. From there you find out the efficiency and the efficiency to be multiplied by the f x f maximum to get the actual feed rate which will be of course, less than f max, because f max is the ideal situation where the maximum number of parts can be delivered, but in case of the actual feed rate, since it is multiplied by the efficiency, efficiency is normally less than 100 percent. So, therefore, f uh, is less than the f maximum, that is actual feed rate will be less than the maximum feed rate. Well, the next uh, feeder, this is the rotary disc feeder this configuration is given in the uh, pictorial view here. Parts are carried by the slots in the rotating disc around the stationary plate until they are aligned to the delivery chute. Now, here there is a stationary hopper and the base of the stationary hopper rotates and in the base of the stationary hopper there are slots and those slots are protected by as you can see this is protected by the ledges, here at the ledges. These ledges will not allow the parts to fall if they are nested in the slots and it will, uh, it will also be, parts will also be protected by this middle disc which is actually stationary. 
So, the parts will not fall down in this direction while rotating because of this stationary disc and because of the ledge the parts will not fall in this direction as well. So, the parts will be picked up from the base of the rotating disc base of the bowl here and when they will the slots will be aligned with the delivery chute the parts from here will be uh, going through the sliding down and going through the delivery chute. There are two types one is the indexing rotary disc feeder another is the rotary disc feeder with a continuous drive in the sense that there are uh, for example, the one that is shown here that for cylinder small cylindrical parts that means a uh, few of the parts will be nested on this slot and therefore, when it is aligning with the getting aligned with the delivery chute it has to stop for some times so that all the parts could slide down the, the slot. Okay. Now, if it is a if it is a continuous drive in that case it will not stop when it is aligned with the delivery chute. So, therefore, the parts have to be different normally we will discuss at a later stage that those parts are the disc type parts. So, one at a time it will go. So, it is going through the delivery chute at that time it is not stopping, but that part is falling down because there is only one part. So, there are two types one is the indexing rotary disc feeder which is shown here that means once again it will go and stop in the next position for some times for all the parts to slide down and then it will continue rotating and so on. Now, here in the indexing rotary disc feeder it is a gen if a Geneva mechanism is employed to index a rotary disc feeder the time taken for indexing will be approximately equal to the dwell period. So, this we are assuming that uh, this is driven by a by a Geneva mechanism. So, when it is indexing and when it is dwelling let us say those two time that two those two times will be the same that is the indexing time and the dwelling time till the parts are moving down the uh, slots. The time is time T s let us say required for all parts in one slot to slide into the delivery chute is given by this. This uh, you must have uh, you must you may remember that this we have actually done that that this is the acceleration okay, and this is the length. So, we are taking we have also uh, discussed it earlier. So, this is the one that is the time interval or in another one also we have shown that this is the dwell time. Okay. So, this dwell time is given by 2 L divided by this acceleration and this acceleration we found out. So, similarly we are getting actually in the uh, in this feeder also the T s square will be equal to 2 L divided by g sin theta minus mu d and the cos theta. Now, the L small l is the length of the slot as it was uh, in the case of the uh, other feeders we have seen that theta is the inclination of the delivery chute and mu d is the coefficient of dynamic friction between the part and the chute. With a Geneva drive the total period of indexing cycle T i is therefore, given by since we said that both the time is the same. So, it will be 2 into this T s. So, it will be 2 T s is equal to 8 L divided by g uh, sin theta minus mu d cos theta root over all right. So, this is the total time taken for the uh, for this to go up and down uh, meaning that uh, it will be uh, indexing and the dwelling. If capital L is the length of the part the maximum number that may be selected in a slot is uh, small l divided by capital L. Small l is the uh, length of the slot and capital L is the length of the part this we have seen earlier. Now, in practice this does not happen this is the maximum number part number of parts. So, it will be multiplied by the efficiency as it was done for other uh, feeders and therefore, that actual feed rate or actual f value of the f which is the feed rate will be given by the maximum feed rate into the e which is the efficiency and maximum feed rate we found out that this is the value. So, therefore, we can find out what is the mean feed rate or average feed rate. So, this is also called the mean or average feed rate and uh, without E when you are not multiplying by the E this is actually the maximum feed rate that the feeder can uh, provide. 
Now, here let me let me tell you why this uh, we are bothered about the maximum feed rate and the actual feed rate. See what happens all these bowel feeders right now that we are discussing these are all connected to the uh, assembly machine as I said. Now, the parts are being fed from the feeders to the assembly machine and there has to be some kind of a feed rate that the to satisfy the uh, requirement of the assembly machine. If the feed rate is more than the machine can accept in that case there will be a clogging because the machine will not accept less than or more than what it requires. But if the feed rate is less than the machine can accept in that case machine has to wait, machine has to starve we say. Okay. So, therefore, we have to very scrupulously design the feed rate of each of these feeders so that it can satisfy exactly the number of parts that the assembly machine can uh, assembly machine requires. Okay. Therefore, uh, this uh, efficiency finding out the efficiency is very important for each of these feeders. Now, there is uh, another hopper feeder which is called the centrifugal hopper feeder. Now, in the centrifugal hopper feeder, the working process or the principle is very different. Here what happens is that there is a hopper, okay, this is the closed and the base of the hopper rotates, rotates at a velocity so that there is a centrifugal force and the parts are located at the base, it is little inclined. At the outer periphery of this inner wall of the hopper, there are slots okay, as it can be seen from the figure. Now, the parts, small parts when the hopper is rotating, the parts will start also rotate and then the parts will get the centrifugal force so that they will go to the outer periphery, outer wall of the hopper and they will get nested in the subsequent slots. Now, when these slots will be aligned to the delivery chute which is at a tangential to the wall of the hopper, the parts will be coming out, these parts will be coming out from the delivery chute. This kind of hopper feeders are suitable for feeding plain cylindrical parts that is one thing and the unrestricted feed rate is proportional to the square root of the hopper diameter and inversely proportional to the length of the part. This we will we can show later, but what is let us see first what is unrestricted feed rate. Unrestricted feed rate is uh, the feed rate when the uh, hopper feeder is not connected to the machine, not connected to the assembly machine. Okay. That means, the this is not uh, related now the feed rate is not related to the number of parts that machine requires alright and that is why it is called the unrestricted feed rate. Let us see how it happens. If a part is moving with constant velocity v around the inside wall of a centrifugal hopper feed hopper, the radial reaction at the hopper wall is equal to the centrifugal force and that centrifugal force is 2 m p v divided by uh, sorry square divided by d. So, m p v square by d this 2 into m p v square by d is the centrifugal force at which the part will be um, the, this is the centrifugal force imparted on the part and the part will be thrown to the outer wall inside the bowel feeder. Where m p is the mass of the part and d small d is the small d is the hopper diameter. The frictional force F w, F w this is the frictional force at the hopper wall tends to resist the motion of the part and this is given by 2 mu w m p and the v square divided by d. Okay. Now, if you uh, see from here well this is uh, understood because this is the centrifugal force. Okay. So, this centrifugal force is multiplied by the mu w which is the coefficient of friction between the part and the hopper wall. Okay. So, if, if this force is multiplied by the coefficient of friction between the part and the hopper wall, this will give you the frictional force at the hopper wall which will tend to resist the motion of the part when the parts are coming to the towards the slots. Uh, when the peripheral velocity of the spinning disc is greater than this velocity v, the disc slips under the part. Okay. And the frictional force F b between the part and the spinning disc is given by this factor. 
let me let me explain it to you what is it what we are saying is that there is a part velocity v okay at which uh, this is happening this velocity in fact we are talking about all right this is the constant parts are moving at with a constant velocity v now when the spinning disk velocity is more than this velocity the part will slip under the spinning disk over the spinning disk because the uh, spinning disk velocity will be more than the part velocity and then there will be a force frictional force between the part and the spinning disk and this can be given as the mpg will be the uh, mass of the part into the gravity and this is the force which is acting actually when the part is on the spinning disk and this will be multiplied by the coefficient of friction between the part and the spinning disk which is mu b. So, similar to this for example, if you see here this is the force into the coefficient of friction here also this is the mp and the g which is acting down and this will be multiplied by the mu b which will give you the uh, frictional force f b between the part and the spinning disk. Now, these two f w and the f b they are same because this is the same part and the same material that uh, is there only thing is that material of the spinning disk and the material of the wall may be different. So, therefore, we are saying that this is the mu w and this is the mu b all right. So, if we equalize them that f b is equal to f w and then if we solve then you will get the value of the v which will be equal to root over g mu b small d is the hopper diameter divided by 2 into the uh, friction coefficient between the wall and the uh, part and the hopper wall this is the mu w. Okay. So, this velocity is important to find out because as we said that the uh, feed rate can be determined from here this will be f max is equal to this velocity that we found out here this velocity divided by the L which is the length of the part all right. So, knowing the V knowing the length of the part we can find out that what will be the maximum feed rate. Well, why we are saying that knowing the velocity because we know the g we will be knowing mu b we know because we know the material we know the material of the part material of the spinning disc material of the wall. So, we can find out what from the from the uh, handbook what is the mu b and what is the mu w mu w is the frictional coefficient between wall and the part. So, if we know the material of the wall material of the part then you can find out mu w material of the spinning disc and material of the part gives you the mu b. So, this is unknown we have selected the hopper diameter okay, small d. So, all these factors will be known part length we will be knowing. So, therefore, we can find out exactly what is the maximum feed rate that we can adjust of course, the maximum feed rate will not get as we said that it has to be multiplied by the efficiency. So, that we could get the actual um, feed rate and this actual feed rate we have to manipulate. So, that it could be uh, this is the unrestricted feed rate as we said that when this feeder is not connected to the machine assembly machine, but when it is connected to the assembly machine we can adjust this f accordingly. Okay, accordingly how much the uh, assembly machine would can take. Okay. This equation shows that the unrestricted feed rate which is f from a centrifugal hopper is proportional to the square root of the hopper diameter square root of the hopper diameter and inversely proportional to the length of the part. Okay. So, this is important when I said that we can actually manipulate that means, we can uh, we can adjust this actual feed rate when the feeder is connected to the assembly machine. Since we know that this feed rate depends on the square root of the hopper diameter and the length if we cannot change the length we have another parameter which is the hopper diameter and by changing the hopper diameter or by regulating the hopper diameter in in, uh, in a way we can actually figure out that how much f we should get. So, that the machine does not starve or the uh, it does not clog meaning that this f should match with the number of parts that the assembly machine requires. So, the rest of the things we will discuss in the next class thank you.